Okay. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, Ishwar Balong in group to tell us about uh, the matching product of the puncture spheres and horizontal superconducting. Uh, all right, so thanks for the opportunity. So I'm from our own group, so feel free to ask any questions. And if I'm going too slow, just let me know, because I think maybe half of you already know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, but I, I will do it slowly. So um, I'll begin with some motivations. Uh, the, the first motivation for myself, because I interested in representation theory, is um, Categorification of representations of SL2. Okay. So there are actually two ways, or at least two ways, to categorify representations of SL2. Categorification of uh, SL2 acting on its fundamental representation. Tensor product n times. Let's say. Let's say in this example. And then um, there are two ways to do it. One way is to use the so-called Higgs branch. The other way is to use the Coulomb branch. So, there is Nakajima's work. Back in the nineties. Um, that 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 uses the Higgs branch to to, to categorify. So. What Nakajima said is that uh, this the particular weight space of lowering the highest weight uh, by k times the root. So th this space, by the way, is n choose k dimensional. So this is n choose k dimensional, complex n choose k dimensional. This is related to the geometry of uh, the Higgs branch of this quiver. Well, this is nothing but uh, P star cross money and KN. And of course, the lowering and raising apertures between weight spaces are described by correspondences, Lagrangian holomorphic Lagrangian correspondences between uh, the various cross money. So, but then there is also another way to do it. Um, Modernly, uh, in math, known as geometric Sataki. Which says that, um, well, let's consider um, So the original statement of Jimmy Sasaki is to say that uh, C2 is actually isomorphic to the cohomology of P1. And this P1 is the P1 that sits inside of the Athan Grossmannian of the dual of, of the dual group of Langlands dual group of SL2, which is PGL2. So the, this this P one is equal to the G of O orbit, uh, P P G L two of O times uh, the co-character T zero. Now, can, can you um, write down the exact way how uh, the Mackey-Jordan pair of graphs to get the categorization of Ah, right. So um, the the so that this weight space, so this weight space here, is isomorphic to um, the borel more homology of, of this of this space. Of course, you can also put down some put 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 some equivariance here, and then you have some deformation parameters here as well, but as a pre preliminary version, this. And then uh, this is that weight space. They're isomorphic as vector spaces. And then the, the lowering and raising operators between the different weight spaces uh, are induced by the Lagrangian correspondences. So T star cross money KN 
uh, also T star Grossmannian K plus one N. And inside of here is the nested Grossmannian, Grossmannian K, K plus one N. The K plane instead of inside of K plus one plane instead of N plane. So, um, Yeah, and these maps probably use full terms in your sheep categories, and on the left ah, side, they correspond to certain maps that were in place blocks. So, if you use coherent sheep categories, you you will actually be considering uh, the. So, of course, you can decategorify to K theory, which is abstractly the same vector space as this. But if you use coherent sheep categories, uh, a more natural way to consider what this is is actually they are the weight spaces of the quantum SL2 acting on. Well, of the quantum, quantum. UQ of SL2 acting. That's a more natural way to, to think according to Malik and Kunko. For Nakajima in the 90s, he's doing homology pre pre as a preliminary version. So, um, okay, does that, does that answer the question? Uh, for the most part, yes. I I want I have trouble understanding what the root exactly implies of the right. So oh, uh, I'm... once you have the roof, um, so let's say here. Sorry, actually, once I once once I have this roof, I can do a push pull or pull push operations that induces map. And these maps are E or F. So, so maybe E goes like uh, this is F, and the adjoint is E. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. And uh, the, the, dual, the, the, the other way of doing it is via geometric Sataki, which interprets the C2 as the cohomology of P1, or more precisely, the cohomology of the IC sheaf on P1 with its favorite uh, cohomological shift. And... Uh, right, so that's... Yeah, if we want to be careful here, we, we need to put one and then Hodge grading one half. That's the uh, most careful grading. It shifts the total thing by this amount. Right, so C2 has a grading. It's uh, one minus one, the weight. In general, the homological grading corresponds to the weight of a principal SL2 in the group G, but here the group G is just a PGL2, so it's just the weight here. And um, so what is C2 tensor N? Those are uh, cohomology of, 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 of subspaces of uh, convolution Grassmannians. So C2 tensor N just corresponds to cohomology of uh, iterated P1 bundle, or iterate for like, N layers with the correct shifts. Since it's n layers is n, n over two, and this is part of the convolution gross money. So convolution on the F and gross money corresponds to tensor representations together. That's what geometric Sataki says, and then. Uh, there's a way to try to decompose this into individual weight spaces. So this is geometric Sataki. One way to understand geometric Sataki in a more um, a slightly more detailed way is to consider the weight spaces. So the weight spaces Corresponding to C2 tensor N and the N minus 2K weight space. 
would correspond to um, the middle homology of uh, F1 Grassmannian slices or generalized F1 Grassmannian slices. So could be generalized. So what are these? Well, um, they are again in one-to-one -one correspondence with the quivers n k, but this time they are the coulomb branches. So these are the so-called coulomb branches of uh, quiver k n, and I call them generalized because uh, it's only when n is greater or equal to two k. When n squared equal to 2k, this weight is dominant, um, then they become true slices in the f of money. Dominant weight is equivalent to saying that they are actual slices. Actual transversal slices to the g of orbits in the f of money. So now in this picture, we have the Higgs branch and Coulomb branches, and this Coulomb branch will be the main player of today. We'll play with this, we'll do several constructions based on the Coulomb branch. So I'm gonna specify the details of the geometry of the Coulomb branch in a moment. But uh, this, is the, this is part of the big motivation that we always have in mind. Okay. The weight in space is a cohomology, is a cohomology of Versus the oh, how is it? Uh, yeah. How is it related? So um, there's a thing. So so, so geometric Sataki has a corollary, or it's part of the paper geometric Sataki that tells you how to go to weight spaces. And the way to go there is called hyperbolic localization to each actually to each uh, lattice point in the F -class mania. It's even finer than this. In the case, well, this is PGL2, so it can be finer, it's the same, but uh, GLN, PGLN is finer than this crude uh, decomposition by cohomological degree. But uh, you can actually relate uh, the F and Gross minus slices with that procedure. In theory, because it's heterochromatic, it's like a convolution? Yes. Yes. N minus 2K tells you to hyperbolically localize to that particular. So the particular lattice point corresponding to the weight n minus two k. Well, um, uh, for this, for the actual half minus um, in they already use got a second rating, but not from right. the so not from the second part of it, but from the start to the get by by this relation of that minus minus. So um, if then if the relation between two gradients is serious, they must have already. I mean, if you for some older implementation theory, if you expect the Hodge gradient, mm -hmm. they had already used the equivariant gradient. Right, because they are on the B side. And on the B side, your Hodge gradient is always mirror to an equivariant gradient, uh, similar to Langlands. Right. So, so, so. so, so, so. so. But, but by the second kind of representation, you had meant the B side, right? Or you meant something else? Oh, but the second one, I mean, later I'll consider, well, this is additive Coulomb branch. I want to consider coherent sheet from this. Yeah. So that's, yeah. this is parallel to Cauty's Kalmitzer. But it's a different, slightly different story. As they just, yeah, Mina mentioned uh, this. I should have mentioned this reference as well, I forgot. It's Cauty's Kalmitzer. They considered just, coherent sheet on this iterative P1 bundle, the whole thing. Whereas we broke it apart, whereas our geometric Sataki uh, can be, well, this is more directly following the original geometric Sataki, but you can always break, you can also break it apart into two weight spaces.
Okay. So after the motivation, what are the coolant branches? Um, I'm going to introduce, for my convenience uh, of, uh, of what's to come, uh, the bow variety description of this uh, coolant branch. So there is the BFN definition. Uh, but it turns out that there is also a thing called Cherkis bow variety, which, uh, whose special cases include those kind of uh, quiver coolant branches in type A uh, or affine type A. So let me introduce some combinatorics uh, of this Cherkis bow variety. There are three uh, main constituents called uh, D5 brains, NS5 brains, and D3 brains. But uh, mathematically, uh, I'll tell you what exactly they are combinatorial, in a combinatorial way. So we, the, you will start from a so-called brain diagram, and then the output is a variety. And the brain, the brain diagram, the input is the brain diagram, something like this. Uh, and the output is a variety. Output is a bow variety. I'll draw the main uh, constituents here. Uh, so we have a D5 brain, which is this uh, line. And we have NS5 brain, which is going into the blackboard. This is a sort of a three dimensional section in the 10 dimensional space time. It's going into the blackboard. And we also have D3 brains running horizontally. And D3 brains can end on D5 or NS5 brains. So locally, the pictures all look like uh, either this. So there might be K1 many D3 brains and K2 many D3 brains on each side of a D5 brain. And to this picture, you associate uh, the field content or just the following data. Uh, vector space CK1 representing the K1 D3 brains. And then there's an arrow here, matrix goes to CK2. And then also little b and little a and two adjoint uh, matrices. B, B, B and B prime, or B1 and B2, let's say. Uh, satisfying the constraint, this constraint is more or less like a moment map condition, although this thing is only, I mean, Poisson is not quite simple, or it's not even Poisson because of this A. But it turns out it's, an, it's a slightly non-obvious statement why the bow varieties in the end turns out to be holomorphic symplectic. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I prefer to understand it as some kind of a moment map constraint. Satisfying the constraint, um, AB minus BA is li equal to little AB. So, uh, so AB1 minus B, B2 times A, uh, or all right, plus little AB is equal to zero. This is the D5 brain data. And there's also an associated stability condition. That's the default one. So the stability condition is that A is a matrix of full rank. So if K1 is equal to K2, A is an isomorphism. A identifies them, um, so on. And then we have NS5 brains. Also, some certain number of these three brains might end up, might end on them. And to this, the data is much like what you would see, sorry, K1 and K2 uh, in, in the Nakajima quiver variety construction. You just have two vector spaces with two arrows going in between them, thought of as T star of the vector space in one direction. So this I'll call C and the other matrix I'll call D. So this is manifestly holomorphic symplectic. And here I do not have any uh, conditions. 
of C and B. And then I need to glue these diagrams together. Whenever I have such a brain diagram, I glue the pieces together um, using symplectic reduction. So I'll write down so the, the moment maps. So there is a GLK1 times GLK2 action on the C and D. Yes. Uh, K1, if you can also write your cross, I'm not sure. Oh, NS5. So the cross, oh, right. So, um, yeah. may, right. So maybe I'll draw it like this later. So the, the picture that I drew there is really looks like this. Right. But I think the physicists in the room maybe can help me explain why like you can draw them in many ways. Um, but I'm okay to, to me, I'm just gonna give this math talk and I'm gonna use combinatoric. So, so to me, the diagrams I assume look like that. And they don't have I mean you can have k1 not equal to k2, that's not a problem. Uh, for C and D, uh, to be determined, there are choices later. I will have to quotient by GLK. So now what's the gluing? Um, I have moment maps here. I have a left moment map, which is, uh, which so there is a GLK1 action here, which is holomorphic, which is holomorphic Hamiltonian. There's a GLK2 action here, which is also Hamiltonian. And therefore I have two moment maps with respect to the left and right GL actions. The first one will give you this matrix which is uh, first C, then D, so it's B, C. The second one is C, D. So there's a left and right moment map. And similarly here, I will have a GLK action two. And actually the here, the left moment map will just be the adjoint matrix B1 itself. Whereas the right moment map will be B2. So there are group actions and their moment maps. So, uh, so for instance, this, this is not a part of the data. So now let's glue them together. So for instance, uh, now I'm going to directly go to the cases that I'm interested in. It's the column branch of a quiver Kn. So let's begin with a specific quiver. Let's say we want to uh, use the bow variety to describe the coulomb branch of uh, the additive coulomb branch of this quiver. Let's say one and let's say four, one, four. And then what I do is that uh, I associate to it the following bow diagram, which is this one. I draw two D5 brains here, and then uh, just one D3 brain in between the NS5 brains. There are four, four NS5 brains. This is the picture. And then associated to, to this picture, I draw the following. So I copy basically what's there to this picture. Um, so picture corresponds to, on the left-hand side, I see zero D3 brains and one D3 brain. So it's zero goes to C. Also zero. There you have a B one. Little B here is zero. I have my little A here, and then I have a four. Then I have four NS five frames, which are here. So which are four four pairs of arrows. And then I have uh, my last uh D, one, two, three, four, then D goes to zero. So B C two. So I'll name this C one, C two, C three, C four, D one, D two, 
D3, D4. And now, uh, that's so how do we glue it? Well, the, the, the way to glue is to do symplectic reductions at each of the nodes. So here, how many nodes, how, how many gluing nodes, how many gluing do we have? We have here, 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 here. So in total, there are five things. There are five C stars. To each C star, we would uh, apply a symplectic reduction. So the moment map here, for instance, the moment map here, the first moment map is equal to B1 minus uh, the moment map here minus the moment map here. And this is D times C, B1 minus B1, C1. We set it to equal to zero. And then we quotient by, the, by this C star. And so here, we have another constraint, mu2 is equal to, uh, now it's C1, D1, that's the first, that's the left moment map, minus the right moment map, D2, C2, and so on. So C1, D1 is equal to D2, C2, and so on, uh, until we get to, of course, uh, C3, D3 is equal to D4, C4, and then lastly, C4, D4, is equal to B2. This is the fifth moment map, mu5, here. So you have five constraints, you quotient by five C stars after those constraints. But of course, this quotient here is a GIT quotient. So you would have to, you, you have a whole space of GIT parameters to, to choose from that I didn't specify here. What, what I should specify here is the default stability conditions coming from the bow variety itself, which came from the, the paper of Cherkis, where he obtained these varieties from solving uh, the, the, some, some ordinary differential equations. So there is a default stability condition that you cannot uh, choose from. You have to follow this, because this is uh, the origin of the bow variety. In this case, the default stability, all the default stability conditions are associated to these D5 frames. And in this case, this map is, of course, full rank from zero to C, but this A needs to be non-zero. So similarly, also B is non-zero. So now you can simplify this portion because I have two stability conditions that are default. I can do a gauge fixing. So here I quotient by a C star. C star acts on this A. Therefore, I can say that suppose A is equal to one, I do not quotient by the C star. So now we can do some gauge fixing. It can, it certainly can. But, but here uh, we, we but, yeah, but, but here we have to describe the column branch there. We have no choices but to take these stability conditions as default. But yeah, they do originate from particular special cases of GIT stability for these two C stars at the far end. So we can do the gauge fixing. A is equal to one, B is equal to one. And then we quotient by three C stars instead, just the middle ones. So after the gauge fixing, let's count how many uh, things do we have? Well, B1 is equal to C1, D1. so you can say that B1 is essentially just gone. Only C1, D1, C2, D2, C3, D3, C4, D4. So now the, the, the actual space is just C, CI and BIs. And little a, little b are fixed by the gauge, They're fixed to B1. B1, B2 can be converted into Cs and Ds. And this, the CI, DI satisfy the constraint that CI, DI is equal to BI plus one, CI plus one. And then it's this thing, quotient by three C stars. Now here, this is the GIT quotient. So you need to specify some, some GIT parameter. Now here you have total freedom to choose whatever GIT parameter you want.
And now let's try to write down uh, global coordinates on this and see what this actually is. So now global functions on this thing. So after a GFT portion, this, this is not an affine variety anymore. It has some projective geometry in it, but the global functions are easy to figure out. So the global functions are, well, you, you need to, uh, con you, you you need to consider um, combinations of of these uh, of these arrows such that uh, the C star acts trivially on the combination. Therefore, you just trace through the quiver, or you take trace of some loop. So it's either uh, yeah. Oh uh, well, it's a quotient, so you can do the categorical quotient. That's going to give you just the global functions, uh, fine spec of global functions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in fact, you can. Take GIT and in fact, in this case, all the GIT quotients will be equivalent, derived equivalent to each other. They differ by flux. Um, but, but now the global functions is common to all GIT conditions. So the global functions are any GIT choice here are the same, same as categorical quotient. And that's tracing through the quiver. So one thing I can do is to trace through the quiver this way, and I get C1, C2, C3, C4, because A and B are both one. So that's one global function. I call it x or u plus for some reason. Uh, c1, c2, c3, c4 uh, in the reverse order. So later, they will be matrices. So c4, c3, c2, c1. It's the correct ordering. And then there is a u minus, which is going back. A and b are both one. It's going back. So that's uh, d1, d2, d3, d4. And then you can start from any node and just do an arbitrary loop. Since CDs are equal to DCs, any loop is just a power of the B matrix or the CD. So then you have a loop called, uh, I'll call it um, Y equal to B1 or equal to B2 or equal to CIDI or DICIs. And then you see the relation. The relation is, uh, u plus u minus is equal to y to the fourth power. This is the A3 surface singularity. So now we see that the Coulomb branch of this quiver uh, 1n is an an minus one surface singularity. This is a simple, just a simple case demonstrating this bow variety combinatorics. And, and in fact, um, if you, okay, so if you do KN, like K, so, if you do KN, you just instead, the circle K just means that you have uh, a total of KD3 brains running between these things. And then nothing, else. you just do the same construction, just, it's just much harder to write down global function, but it's still possible. And, uh, so I'm not going to write down the global functions, but the picture is the same. Change C to CK. Some picture is something like this if n is equal to two. And then the constraint here, for instance, B1, uh, like C, B1, C1, B1, uh, C1, C2, C1, B2, B2. I would have some constraints, so a little a and little b. Um, but for this one, I'll have, well, there's one thing I need to tell you, which is what is the default statistic. That's the only thing I'll need to tell you for the rest of the talk. Um, so the default stability is is that um, the image of a generates ck under the action of b1 and the dual statement for B. So, all right, polynomial of B1 acting on the image of A is equal to CK, and then the dual condition, which is the polynomial of B2 transpose acting on the image of B transpose um, is equal to the dual vector space CK at the end. These are the two default um, 
the basic conditions. With this default stability, um, the, the two GLKs on the two far ends acts freely. So, so, so this implies that the two GLKs on the ends uh, on the, on the ends act act freely. Yeah. In general, if we're given a rise to two networks and G out actually uh, and the stability parameter, it's quite hard to figure out what all the uh, global functions and the kappa semi invariant functions. Uh, now that has been done as you already seem to uh, have in mind here for Nakajima like, curve, right? So the uh, Higgs branches. Mm -hmm. That is that's the result of uh, the Gram from Chesley and Vera. Um, and uh, where, where is this, and for what of the cases is this known for uh, Coulomb branches? Uh, for Coulomb branches or for bow varieties? Uh, that's a great question. I. Uh, does anyone like as anyone, anyone in the audience know about the status of the literature? So that's a very classical yeah, that I know. The traces, those are like, uh, in yeah, of but but in, in the in the in the case of uh, Coulomb branches, it, it is possible to, to write down global functions yeah, actually. So the KN one yeah, yeah. Like all stuff or, literature. So for yeah, so for instance, for this one, I can write down the global functions. In, in some in some way, so it's just can, uh, you, there are other characterizations of the atomizations of all these things that are kind of automatic to write down some sort of feature. Now, if you wanted to like get explicit formulas or like the things in that ring as functions of like the B C P, that's in general not trivial, but I don't think it's particularly hard. But it's not possible. Right. In, in, for, for, it, like, for example, for N is zero, it's like automatic. Uh, for n non-zero, I think you know. It's, it's, there, there, yeah, there is a way to work it out, and I actually uh, tried it. <laughs> there is a way I, I wrote it down on on the notes, but it is uh the the it's similar to to that. It's similar to that. It's actually not um, it's just taking trace instead of saying that they are just just numbers. Actually, taking trace of higher high, higher and higher powers, eventually you will get all of the functions. Okay, the two GLK act freely. You can also so these two conditions in particular means that uh, B one and B two are regular matrices, so they have maximal Jordan blocks possible. Of course, if their eigenvalues are distinct, they are just uh, diagonalizable. But if their eigenvalues are not distinct, they have maximal Jordan blocks possible. So B one and B two are regular; they have maximum Jordan blocks. Maximum Jordan blocks. So the, this condition and the fact that uh, this matrix has a cyclic vector is equivalent to each other. One, the example I did is I think one four, because I have four pairs of arrows here. Yeah, A3 surface is quiver 1, 4, right? Because quiver 1, 2 is A1 surface. Okay. Quiver 1, 2 is P star P1. It has uh, two fixed points. Uh, it's always confusing. So the way I remember it is just four, you draw, just draw four pairs of arrows here. So that later you have y to the fourth power. So so, so now let's talk about, uh, since we're going to eventually get to mirror symmetry, I didn't keep track of the time. Oh, I'm not going, doing good on time. So <laughs> we'll probably end in two and a half hours. Uh, so to, to discuss mirror symmetry, I want to consider coherent sheets on these coolant branches in particular, or later some modifications of these coolant branches. But, how do I study coherent sheets on the Coulomb branch? Well, let's start from the abelian case, which is easy. The abelian case is just a abelian quotient. And uh, I can study line bundles. I can classify line bundles on this thing. 
pretty well. So just take that as an example. Now, uh, let me write down a few line bundles. So since we quotient by three C stars effectively, two of them are gauged away, free action. We have three degrees of freedom to twist our line bundles. So each line bundle on that, uh, so each line bundle on the resolved uh, coulomb branch, the unresolved one is just taking the spec of the global functions, categorical quotient. The resolved one um, line models on this are parameterized by three uh, integers. By a right O of uh, N1, N2, N3. But N1, N2, N3 corresponds to, corresponds to the twisting given by these three C star actions. Or in the geometry, you actually see the picture for this is it's the fattening of this, this kind of a projective geometry, where you have three P1s. And N1, N2, N3 are the degrees of the line bundle on each of the P1s. N1, N2, N3. And now uh, it's easy to read. So it's easy to compute the harms between these line bundles when they um, actually, uh, when uh, the, so when, when the ends for one line bundle and the ends for the other line bundle are close to each other. So there are some particular harms which are easy to compute. So for instance, I can compute, so harm zero from the structure chief to O of, um, let's see. So or I, can, I can do anything, let's say one zero zero. Suppose we want to compute this harm. So this harm space is equal to a specific portion of the graded uh, coordinate ring which is the degree one zero zero part. So it's the degree one zero zero part of this uh, graded uh, projective coordinate ring, which is here, of the projective coordinate ring. Oh, C adjoined, uh, this CD matrices, uh, mod out the relations. And uh, the degree one zero zero part is generated over the degree zero 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 part by two generators. And you can read the two generators off of the bow variety diagram. Like if you look at this arrow called uh, C1, C1 goes from the trivial C to, to the first C with the C star action. So C1 has weight one zero zero. So for instance, inside of here, this is inside of here, there is C1. And there's another thing. So if you actually go through the whole, well, there's C1, there's also D4, D3, D2, which kind of passes through all the, all the two other C stars and landed on the first C star. So there's C1, there's also this combination of D, D, D4, D, D, okay, D, D2 first, then D3, then D4. So the claim is that uh, it's not hard to check that these two gen these two generate this whole hum this whole hum space under the ring, uh, which is the degree zero part. We've computed the degree zero part. Is this part degree zero means in C star invariant? So it's generated over it's a it's a module generated by C one and D, uh, it's a module generated by C of U plus U minus and y times uh, c1 and d, d2, d3, d4. And vice versa, you can, uh, sorry, and just you can, gen et cetera, you can generalize to the, there are some other harms which are super easy to compute. One, zero, zero, they go to zero, one, zero. And so on. So you, you move one step at a time. So this one is generated by C2. 
and the complementary these like d1, d3, d4. Uh, actually, in, in a certain order, like D3, D4, D1, maybe. But the, the order here doesn't really matter because all of these are uh, abelian ring. And uh, the last thing to write, the last line model, the last main player is 01010. Can go to 0001, and that's, that is all we need. Really. This is generated by D three um, and and the corresponding Ds D four D one D two and you might ask uh, what about C four well C four just rotates back O zero zero one maps to O zero 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 that's C four so there's a cyclic structure you soon see a cyclic quiver cyclic half a quiver coming up yes. Yes, yes. Yes. And uh, so essentially, we are also doing the extension of the cure one, like <laughs> extension of that phenomenon by explaining that the home spaces are uh, actually given by the weighted part of the semi parent ring. Yeah. Home uh, zero only for now. And I'm going to say something for a higher. There, there was, uh, I wrote these specific ones because the higher homes behave, behave well. I'll explain in a moment. Uh, for the abstract, do you think for the cluster talk for any, uh, any affine variety uh, when we divide up the by, by some group? Uh, um, at, at least for C star, I think yes. Uh, like just line bundles. And to divide by GL group, then uh, the associate, so you will be considering vector bundles. The line bundles and then the humps between the vector bundles uh, can be these. It, that's that's more okay. I haven't, I haven't thought seriously about that, so there might be a way. Yeah. yeah. But uh, okay, so you might be asking. <laughs> so what do I do if this is K four? I'm going to explain. There's Ben Webster's very excellent paper <laughs> that does it, which actually just says that it's just almost symmetric product of this picture, almost. So the, the, there's a trick there. So I don't have to directly deal with K4, actually, uh, thanks to Ben Webster's paper. But, but let, me, let me finish the cycle. The last one from zero, from 0001 to 0000. And this one is generated by D4 and the C, C, C4 and the rest of the Ds. So altogether, you can organize all of these data into a quiver. And uh, the, the quiver looks like this. Um, cyclic quiver have these and these running in between them. Sorry, one zero zero. Zero one zero, then go forward, uh zero zero one winds back. So when you if you go this way, this is C one, that's C two, C C three and C four. And the outer cycle is the D D matrix. It's a, D1, D2, D3, D4. Right, but but I, but I do think the C star thing. I mean, the the statement about the projective uh, coordinate ring is more. Yeah, that's more. 
Yeah, that's a billion. Yes, a billion. A, yeah, but that, okay. By yeah, avatarical mean a billion quotient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. You could organize the data into this quiver and everything. So that the relations are just kind of moment map constraints at the four nodes. DV is equal to DC. So it's a quiver with relations. The relations are, so this is the quiver with relations. And now the theorem is the following. So the theorem is that in fact, if you know these four line bundles, you know how to deal with the category of coherent sheaves on this whole A3 surface. So the coherent sheaves derive category of coherent sheaves on this column branch one four, the resolved one, is uh, generated by these four line bundles, the direct sum of these four line bundles. And moreover, this is a tilting generator. So it's, gener it's generated by um, the tilting generator the direct sum of all four. So this, uh, the power of the theorem is saying that uh, all the higher, first of all, all the higher humps between them vanish. This is whose theorem, this is, since this is the hypertoric case, I think it might even be a theorem in one of BLPW's papers. I cannot uh, trace, um, oh, oh, this is also a toric case. So this could be a theorem, it's a theorem for from many different sources. Hard to trace who first showed it. Yeah. But for general KN, it's a theorem of the Webster, of course. This is a special case of a theorem of the Webster. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll mention that paper after I go to KN. Right. So this we have this theorem and this very very nice quiver description. Um, so, so in fact, uh, this representation, sorry, this category is just equivalent to the bounded derived category of representations of this quiver with relations. Yeah. The functor from here to here is, is the Uneda functor. In other words, you take arm um, from the tilting generator to whatever you started with. I'll denote this guy by T. The T, this T has four components. This corresponds to the four nodes. You hum T to whatever input you started with. You will get uh, four chain complexes with these maps and relations. This is an equivalence. This is just uh, another way of saying that, of stating the theorem. This, everything is very concrete here. In, in this in in a billion cases okay so this ends the first basic review of both varieties uh, the, the the case of kn I will leave until um, after the next section. So, so now let's mention the main player. So the main player of today is not quite the coolant branch of KN. That's a precursor. What we actually want to do today is to consider a slight generalization of this bow variety picture. But I have to introduce this bow variety first. So a slight generalization is uh, what I call a... Uh, partial 3D n equal to 2 extension. Of the bow variety. The bow variety is in physics literature. Uh, typically associated with 3D n equal to 4 gauge theory. So what do I mean by this? Again, I'll give a explicit mathematical construction. And uh, 
just ex explain, but I'll explain my, my motivation a little bit. So the first thing that you read from physics paper is that all of these moment map constraints actually came from computing the critical locus of a potential. So the, the most uh, physical way to think about those moment map constraints, so 3D n equal to four moment map constraints, Let's do it in the Higgs branch case because Nakajima variety is uh, more more well known in the literature. Uh, let's say let's consider this Nakajima variety. So this, uh, for K n in general, in the end you get T star cross minus K n. But how did you get it? You have two maps uh, called I. Can remember which is i, which is j, right? i and j, and then the moment map constraint is mu. In, so the mu inverse zero condition tells you that uh, if you compose j and i in this way, you get zero. And this way means I first do j, then I do i. So i j is zero. This is the moment map constraint. So you typically do this, and then you quotient by GLK with the choice of a stability parameter plus or minus. This is just one GLK. So you take the semi-stable part or just GIT quotient GLK. This is the usual way you construct it. Um, another way to rephrase this construction is to add in another matrix uh, called phi or called, called B there. It's not, it's not say, not identical to the B there, it's called phi. And then to say that, let's consider instead th this uh, Z-graded matrix circularization category. So I'm gonna define matrix circularization category in a moment, but uh, let me first write down the, not not the notations. So in fact, uh, the coherent sheaves on this GIT quotient, in other words, T star cross minus KN is isomorphic to the following matrix circularization category. whose ambient space is the, well, I'll write a GLK equivariant matrix circulation category, of course, because I did the GLK quotient there. GLK equivariant matrix circulation category. The ambient space is just JI, JI and phi, satisfying a certain stability condition. So just uh, the collection of uh, triples J, I, and phi, all of them satisfying the stability condition. Specified by the theta. And then um, the, the stability either says that uh, I mean, J is injective or I is surjective. And then I have a superpotential W, which is the trace of the following product of matrix trace of uh, phi times IJ, so phi times the moment map. And now typically matrix factorization categories are Z mod two Z graded, as they are two periodic complexes. You might ask, uh, since the coherent sheets are Z graded, how do I give the matrix factorization a Z grading? It turns out that uh, to give the matrix factorization a Z grading, I'll write Z graded matrix factorization. So Z grading on the matrix factorization is given by a C star action on this total space. And of course commute with GLK action that scales this potential W by weight two. So Z grading on matrix circulation is given by um, the C star action, uh, or right, the C star Q action, which uh, fixes I and J and scales phi by weight two. So why weight two in particular? Because if you look through the definition of matrix factorization, this definition is the category of uh, I mean, two GLK equivariant coherent sheaves E and F, 
with two arrows between them, both called D, and then D squared is equal to W. So if you want a cohomological degree on this that separates 0, 2, and 4, you need to make sure that there is a gradient such that W has weight 2. As D squared has cohomological weight, it raises the, the whole thing by cohomological weight 2. So there's the way 2 comes from. And once you apply this Z grading in this fashion, there's a theorem that is quite useful uh, when we think about matrix factorizations. Uh, it's called Kazu matrix factorization theorem, which just tells you that uh, these two are equivalent. And the theorem is uh, not very hard. It's a tautological theorem, more or less. Um, so this theorem theorem called causal matrix factorization. Which tells you that uh, suppose I have a space X, uh, I have a I have smooth variety X. Uh, this, uh, well, Eisenbahn is the one who introduced matrix factorization. Most likely it's already hidden in his paper, I think. But again, I am bad at literature here. <laughs> who first wrote it? Uh, I, I mean, a, a, a source that I learned it from is uh, Oblomkov's notes on the uh, matrix factorization. So there, there's Oblomkov's notes, may, maybe due to Eisenbahn originally. Oh. Yeah, but you look like there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, oh, that's not that's 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 Orlov's theorem. That's, Orlov. that's not this one. That's not this one. This, this one is more or less. Uh, this one is more tautological. Well, both theorems are beautiful, but this one is like slightly more tautological than that one, I think. Um, that one is not. I don't think that one. I think of as quite tautological. Go ahead. But that that one is also by more or less more or less in already in Eisenberg's original paper, I think. But there's on Blomkov's note, take X a smooth variety and consider the following thing, which just literally looks like that. Right? Consider X times C N of some just an affine affine space parameterized by phi one, phi two, phi n. I call them phi precisely because there is called phi. On this space, if you consider the matrix factorization, so X is a smooth variety, and suppose I have n functions on X. So F1, Fn are functions on X, it's global functions. And then I have the C gradient matrix factorization category here, where uh, the weight the weights here for phi is two, and the weight here is zero. That's exactly. In, as in that setting. And my potential W, the potential function is equal to a summation of Fi Fi I. And this matrix factorization category is isomorphic to the coherent sheaves on the common zero locus of these functions on X. But if the intersections of the zero locus are not transversal, you do derive an intersection. So it's the, this is equal to the de de derived common zero locus. The derivedness is only needed when their transversality is not satisfied. Derived zero locus. F1 is equal to F2 equal to Fn is equal to zero on X. So these two are the same as each other. The, the, the proof is causal resolution. The proof is basically causal, co you complete the causal resolution into a matrix factorization in a unique way. It turns out there's a unique way to, to complete. So uh, let's say uh, I have the structure sheep here, okay. right? And I want to send it there. Right here, I have a structure sheep on this so called derived intersection. The structure sheep itself can be resolved. Um, on the on the ambient space, by by a lot of structure sheets, <laughs> by two to the n copies of structure sheets, 
a causal resolution. Right? The structure sheaf here is the structure sheaf on this derived intersection is a large causal complex. Right? Like, uh, like uh, nothing like this. Uh, uh, yeah. It's derived intersection just means that you just consider this causal complex. And then you send this thing here, complete into a matrix factorization, complete the arrow in the other way, such by, the, uh, by, by, by some of these phi i's, phi i functions, complete into a matrix factorization. That's roughly speaking what the functor does. Um, well, the, the intuition here is just that when you compute, <laughs> this is Lagrange multiplier. So the phi, the phi i's are the, parameter, are the lambda parameters in the Lagrange multiplier. When you take differentiation with respect to phi i, you get fi is equal to zero. That's the intuition. The, the only um, unsymmetric thing here is that the phi has weight two. So normally you would also differentiate the x variables to get something, but here that's invisible. So the, so the, oh, the, uh, the structure sheaf on this thing is just this complex. If you, if you embed it into the original ambient smooth variety. So that, so, so you are asking, so, uh, if you do that, you will be computing harm i lower star of O of this derived intersection to i lower star. This is the, no, the, the harm to itself is just the DG algebra, which is given by um, the global section of this thing. It will be a, it will be a deep, so the, the, the harm of the structure sheep to itself is like a rank one free module over, over itself. And you just consider the global section of this and that thing turns out to be a DG algebra, and that's the harm from the structure sheep to the structure sheep. In other words, the global sections of the structure sheep. So, so you can think of this as sort of a relative spec of a, of a DG al al algebra. Sure, yeah, that's, a, that's an ac excellent case. If you do that, you just get uh, more or less a trivial, uh, the causal complex will be quite trivial, but you will get a lot of epsilons, I mean, a lot of like uh, degree one generators. You get ex exterior algebra, tensor, whatever used to be the <laughs> sheaf of functions. Just get a free copy of exterior algebra. Yeah, yeah, you get the symmetric polynomials on phi, right? That's so it's, so it's these things have weight two, those things have uh, like co-module weight one. That's the, yeah, symmetric product is causal dual to, to um, so, so it's not only causal resolution, but also uh, the classical symmetric alternative causal duality. It's called causal matrix factorization for a good reason, for two reasons. They are also related to each other. So if you apply that principle and uh, just, uh, to, to here, the only thing you need to check is that uh, setting ij to equal to zero uh, give you a, a, are, are transversal to each other. Like, there are many equations here; they're transversal to each other. That's the only thing you need to check. So this is the uh, framework for three D n equal to four moment map constraints. Like, every time they appear, uh, this is a, a good way to understand them. Uh, and now let's do something. So, and now when I consider 3dn equal to two, so called 3dn equal to two, both, uh, both varieties are moduli spaces. Um, what I will learn from physicists is that uh, you would turn on a certain mass deformation. So, so now th this thing I take as motivation. So 3dn equal to two, What happens is that I turn on a uh, mass deformation. So the potential W that used to be traced uh, ij phi phi ij. Uh, 
Now I add to it one more term, this case phi squared times some mass, set it to be one. So this is turning on the um, deformation at one node. Suppose that at one node, I do not do um, the original game. So let's do it in an example. So in the bow variety example, we, we'd like to handle the following local case. For instance, we have something like this. It might be some, some, something here. Like C1, C2, C3, D, D1, D2. And then uh, my moment map constraint. So as usual, let's play that game. So here I do not set C1, D1 to equal to C2, D2 yet. I'd add in a part of the potential. Uh, I uh, add in a field, add in the so-called gauge field called phi, adjoint uh, matrix phi. And I say that the old thing, the old 3dn equal to four, four bow variety uh, moment map constraint. It's saying that I turn on the potential, w is equal to trace of phi times the moment map. And the moment map is equal to this thing minus that thing. So this thing is C, first d, then c. That's d1, c1 minus c2, d2. This is the, the old game. And I consider graded matrix circularizations where phi has degree two, these guys have degree zero. But now, um, so the new deformation, which only preserves half of the supersymmetry, is the following. So the trace phi uh, d1 c1 minus c2 d2 um, plus m times phi squared. So now we'll have to get rid of this phi from this new potential. So we always want to get rid of phi in the, in the, at the very end. So to get rid of the phi, we just, uh, physicists would say, let's integrate the phi out. And essentially, that's just completing the squares or the genre transforms. So, so we, in fact, um, I'll take the following as a mathematical definition. But this is like the physical motivation for me. That, in fact, what you will get is that I complete this into squares, and I throw that uh, Square away, just keep whatever is left. So this will become, so this we can integrate out phi. And just get trace uh, d1, c1, c2, d2. It's because the difference between this is sort of like a complete completion of square terms. So this is the replacement of my moment map constraint. So now I no longer have this, the, this matrix phi. It's gone. But also, I no longer have this moment map constraint either. What I had is this leftover super potential. Oh, like when you literally complete the squares, right? You would square this. But uh, I, so by trial and error, I prefer that. I don't see that. <laughs> Maybe Spencer has a better reason. But it's, to me, it's trial and error. So I take that as a definition. But this constraint is not the only constraint that I'm going to have here. It turns out that there is another constraint that Spencer derived from string theory. Uh, so M. Uh, or So it, 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 in fact, there is another constraint. Um, so instead of the moment map constraint, uh, Spencer computed from string theory, so it's due to Spencer computed from string theory that uh, we, we might also want to add a further constraint uh, 
uh, which is which says that the left moment map and the right moment map matrices commute with each other. So I'll explain what this is good for uh, in from two points of view, but um, it seems that we want to add this condition at least so far. So what is this condition good for? It's good for well maybe for an artificial reason. Um, Whenever we have this constraint, it's easier to write down what this potential is in terms of eigenvalues of D1s, C1 and C2, D2, because they are they commute with each other. You can sim simultaneously upper triangularize, upper triangularize. So, but the actual reason, um, so for, for one thing, when you add in this constraint, so this is actually just, uh, since the middle node is C to the K, how many constraints are there? There's actually k squared minus k many constraints. Well, on the nose is k squared many, but essentially it's k squared minus k many constraints added to the to the original thing. So um, if you compare this with the mu inverse zero, so if you compare this with the so this, whereas the original mu inverse zero is k square many constraints, so they differ by k. And this will be important in the, in the degree counting later, or in the in dimension counting later. This is one observation. And to me, this condition is also natural from a quiver representation point of view, in the sense that, um, let's, try to do, let's try to see what this is in an example, in, in our billion example first, because we'll need that example anyway to proceed. Um, I won't erase this because I want, I like this quiver picture. And uh, okay, so for example, what is this condition doing? Let's consider the, the qu quiver, the Coulomb branch of the quiver one, two, for yeah. instance. Yeah, like only two so which, which example, that example? Did this add on quiver? So the, this one has four nodes, but this one will have two nodes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, in this one, we'll have two nodes. And lo, lo, yeah, but, but this is a local operation. I just want to use this uh, to like demonstrate. Um, so this corresponds to a vote diagram. There's two here, so I have two pairs of arrow going back and, back and forth. But essentially, all of these are gone. You're just left with C1, C2, D1, D2, after all the default stability conditions. And you're quotient by the middle C star. So this is uh, equal to C4, D1, C2, D1, D2, D1, D2, quotient by the C star with weights. Uh, so the weight of C1 is 1. And the weight of uh, C2 is minus 1. The weight of D1 is also minus 1. The weight of D2 is 1. So 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. And this is a very... Uh, Classical Fourier uh, quotient is that it, you will actually get uh, called the conifold singularity if you take this. The global functions will become. Oh, so sorry, uh, I didn't add the moment map constraint here because I chose to deform on this node here. I deform here as above, following the recipe above. But when I deformed here, I would rather draw my quiver in the following way that this quiver splits into the two splits into one and one. And this one becomes a very specific node called a fermionic node, which I want a black color, but I'm on the blackboard. So I'll use a triangle to demonstrate. So this triangle is called a fermionic node. And one one means that I divide here and do a deformation here. You can see the global functions now become, well, I still have my 
u plus, which is c1, c1, c2, u minus, which is d1, d2. But then all of a sudden, since I didn't have c1, d, d1 is equal to c2, d2, I, I, have two, I have two more generators of my coordinate ring, which is d1 and d2. Or in other words, c1, d1 and c2, d2. C, that's why it's equal to B1, W is equal to B2. And then the glo global coordinate ring now becomes U1, U plus U minus is equal to ZW. And it's easy to see how this general generalizes. So, uh, well, when you add in the moment map constraint, Z is equal to W, this is the A1 singularity. But now this is like a deformation of the A1 singularity in one direction. There's a conical singularity. And this resolution here, this GIT quotient here, is actually O minus one Dirac sum O minus one, the total space of that. And uh, so to, to, to describe coherent sheets on O minus one Dirac, Dirac sum O minus one, the procedure is still the same. You just copy the old procedure, but now you just lose one of the constraints and it's, it's not, that constraint wasn't crucial in the old calculation either. So now we get a modified quiver description of so coherent sheets on uh, O minus one derived sum O minus one. The result conical is isomorphic to uh, via the Uneda function. So the, 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 the conclusion here is that there are two line bundles which tilting generates the whole category. So this is uh, generated by Similar to there, there I have four because I had more uh, pairs of C's and D's. Now this is only generated by O and O1. In between O and O1, I have uh, the following quiver. From O to O1, I have, so here I just write my C1, C2, D1, D2 in a certain way. So this is my C1, that's C2, D1, D2, right? But now on this conifold, I no longer have the moment map constraint. The C1, they have no relation here. So I have no relation here as well. But uh, in fact, no relation is not completely true because when I consider the Uneda function, well, these C's and D's, they commute with each other. So here I do have the constraint, which is obvious in this setup, but it won't be obvious once I consider what kind of, so the relation in this quiver is actually C1, D1 commutes with C2, D2. D1, C1 commutes with C2, D2. And also vice versa. So this is, uh, why I kind of like these uh, commutativity constraints. When you consider, uh, so this is equal to representations of, of, the, of a certain quiver. And this quiver is not totally without relation. There are commutativity relations here. So the, this is a generalized quiver picture uh, from 3dn equal to four to partially 3dn equal to two, deformed at one node. Like this kind of, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the equivalence is literally the Uneda function. The harm from the tilting bundle O direct sum O1 to whatever, to the input. Yeah. You get two chain complexes here with these arrows. And the, the, since they are not necessarily one dimensional vector spaces, this commutativity constraint is important. So, uh, so this constraint is pretty natural in my mind. Okay, so this will be the key uh, deformation that we're doing. And uh, so, so, um, so 
on top of this, of course, there's our potential I forgot to write. There is a potential W is equal to C1, C1, D1, C2, D2. So C1, D1, D2, D2, in whichever order here. This is a B. So let's then, um, so, so then this finishes all I wanted to prepare about the B model. Now let's go to the A model. So now let's uh, say something basic about homological mirror symmetry. And this okay, technically I have only half an hour left. Uh, let's see. Um, so the A model. Uh, so let, let me say some uh, say a few words about homological mirror symmetry first. So homological mirror symmetry, the duality between the A models and B models, where A model deals with Fukaya categories or microlocal sheaves, uh, and the B model deals with coherent sheaves. The symplectic geometry versus algebraic geometry. The preliminary examples are, for instance. If the B model is coherent sheaf on the C star, A model is Fukaya category of uh, T star S1, which is also C star given this specific uh, exact sympathetic structure. And uh, a few words about the grading. So on the A side, to give it a mass lock grading, you need to pick a specific uh, holomorphic volume form. So, so so here this is also C star. Let's say this is let's say this is C star of U, this is C star of C. Then the C gradient here, you can choose to be holomorphic volume form can be chosen as DZ over Z. And then the cohomological degree of U here will be zero. Uh, and and you can and you can ask what if I want to change my gradient? Of course you can. Uh, you can do a weird many weird Z gradings. Uh, like you can choose omega to be whatever you want, like maybe DZ over Z to the end, for any N. And then the mirror will not be coherent sheets on anything classical. It will be coherent sheets on some DG algebra. So it will be modulus over, over uh, the DG algebra, which is C adjoint UU inverse. A u here would have degree uh, plus or minus n minus one. Can't remember. <laughs> Can't remember exactly the convention. So this is the cohomological degree. But twice, sorry. Yeah, that's important. Sorry, twice. Plus or minus twice n minus. So the a picture for this is that here I have my T star S1 as follows and the generator is given by this Lagrangian. And to compute the harm from this Lagrangian to itself, I'm gonna get, so this is gonna be the harm of the, from the generating Lagrangian L to itself. And to compute this, you, you first do a wrapping of the first Lagrangian and then you intersect with itself, with itself. So the wrapping goes this way on the on, on the cylinder. You would wrap in this direction here, wrap in this direction here. So in the end, you're gonna get uh, integer many intersection points between the two Lagrangians. And the generator is called U or U inverse. And now let's uh, actually puncture the cylinder. So. This example will be the first, will be our first example. It will be the quiver one one. So it's actually just as simple as puncturing that cylinder. So we can puncture the cylinder. Um, let's say, what about on the Fukaya side, I consider the Fukaya category of this geometry, this exact sympathetic manifold. D star with the puncture in the middle. Now here I need to specify a grading. Let's say the puncture is at position A. If this is zero, that is infinity. And I also I'll have to select a holomorphic volume form. 
So here, I would, so suppose this is again called the Z plane. I'll write first maybe DZ over Z, and then I divide it by C, C minus A. So for instance, I can, I can choose arbitrary homomorphic volume form here, any arbitrary powers here. Um, for this choice, uh, at zero, it's essentially like DZ over Z, or same, uh, so same at A. So at zero, it's, it's essentially the same as DZ over Z. So, so, so here, the wrapping or the intersection of, 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 of a Lagrangian ending here with itself after, after it wraps around is degree zero, and same here. So this puncture also has degree zero. And the infinity puncture, if you do a change of coordinate, at infinity, this is similar to dz over z squared, which is, in terms of infinity, just d1 over z. So here is degree two. And the total degree is proportional to the Euler characteristic. So the way to figure out the degree is that the total degree, the formula is that total degree at the punctures is equal to uh, two, uh, two times plus or minus the Euler characteristic. Let's figure out this is one circle, another circle, and the Euler characteristic is, is minus one. So, but maybe I mess this, okay, I, I think it's minus. I think like a minus two times the Euler characteristic of the space. As long as, so there are three integers to choose from, as long as they sum up in this case to be minus, to be two, then we, we will have a homomorphic volume form corresponding to it and agree a Z grading. Okay, this is the A side. And on the B side, what do I do? Well, I can learn from the, try to learn from the A side and try to learn and draw some Lagrangians here and let them intersect each other. For instance, I can draw this Lagrangian and harm the endomorphism of this Lagrangian will be, well, almost the same as that, but the relations is a bit different because I can, same, I can wrap in this direction or I can wrap in that direction they will have the many intersection points. But uh, if you ask about composition, since there's a hole in the middle, it turns out that uh, U times U inverse is no longer one, it's equal to zero. It turns out that a certain triangle of composition cannot exist. Like here, when you compose like U, U, U minus and, and identity, Maybe this is, yeah, when, when, you, when you try to do this composition, you cannot fill in the triangle because there is a hole in the middle. So the relation is uh, C x, y mod x, y is equal to zero. And here I need to be specific about which is x, which is y. C o infinity a, suppose wrapping here is called x and wrapping here is called y then x has cohomological degree zero, whereas y has cohomological degree two. This is a DG algebra, just the differential is zero. Everything is on even cohomological dimension. And so similarly, I can also compute endomorphism of this guy. So, uh, so this guy is pretty similar. It's actually symmetric to that one. If you think about this as zero, this that as infinity. So this one will be, this is already called X, that's Y. Wrapping here, suppose it's called Z. Then this is a CXZ mod XZ. Same reason as before. Whereas X still has, X has, X and Z both has cohomological degree zero because of my choice of the grading. And similarly, the other one is just CYZ mod YZ. So the corresponding B model is uh, actually what I claim. Corresponding B model is the following, where I, the corresponding B model will be the following, will be the matrix factorization category corresponding to the deformation of this particular Coulomb branch.
So what is this? Well, in terms of bow diagrams, it's like this. I only have one, so one here, one pair of arrow here. Essentially, all of these are gone, and I do not need to even quotient by a C star. Everything is fixed by gauge. I don't have internal like Cs. So here I just have C and D, B1 and B2. And by drawing like this, I mean, I do a cut here. I mean, I deform this node, so I deform here. By deforming here, it means that the only constraint that they have, so apart from the gauge fixing, A is equal to one, B is equal to one, as usual. And B1 is equal to CD, but B2, not, ne not necessarily equal to C, C, equal to DC. B1 is equal to DC. And the space here is just C3, B2, CD. That's the space without quotient C star, just the C3 with a potential, so it's MF, matrix factorization here with a potential trace of uh, CD, DC. But here, I do not have uh, the other pair of DCs, just B. So trace of left moment map times right moment map. This is, in this case, it's just trace of CD times B2. This is my matrix factorization. Uh, and I haven't specified the Z grading yet. The Z grading is going to be a C star action here that scales the whole thing by weight two. And in fact, here I want to choose C, my Z grading to, to, to scale um, CD. So either CD by weight zero, B2 by weight two, or the other way around. Now let, let's look at, I want one or the other so to, to exactly match that convention. Let's say I want B2. If it's not true, I'll just change my convention there. Say I want. CD to have degree zero, B2 to have degree two, or the inverse, doesn't really matter. So both C and D have degree zero, and B2 has degree two. Inside of here, we can find the three mirror uh, matrix factorizations, mirror to those objects in the Foucault category, in this Lagrangian. So for instance, uh, if I want an object whose endomorphism has degree zero, I'm just gonna write down, so I'll write down the mirror here. The mirror of this one is a structure sheaf where you know, X and Z both has degree zero. So X and Z has got to be mirror to C and D. So I write CD together and B. This is one instance. So here, x is c, z is d. And for this one, y has degree two, so y is b2. So for this one, uh, it corresponds to the matrix factorization. I can factor this triple product in, in, in a way which singles out uh, b2 and one of c and d. I suppose x is c times b2 and I single out c. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually a little bit worried about my, my convention. It's, it's possible that uh, I used a different convention than, <laughs> than what I wrote in my notes. So here I drew arbitrary, it, okay. It doesn't really, okay. I think it's slightly better if I change my A to be degree two. It will match exactly what I'm gonna say. Sorry about that. Let's change, let's change. Then just dz over z, right? Total degree is still two. Well, let's change this. Okay, xz now, z has, x is zero. Z, z, z is two. And then x and y are both zero. And then now I have to rewrite my matrix calculations. So this one, 
x and y are both zero, x and y corresponds to c, c and d. Okay, so c will be wrapping on this side, and the d will correspond to wrapping on this side, and the b will correspond to wrapping here on, on the whole. That's also a general rule. It's generalizable directly to one m and n. This this rule. So this matrix circulation will be O. I will write X and Y together, which are C's and D, both C, D, B, B, B2. So and this one will be, uh, I put X and Z together. X will be C and Z will be B2. So C, B2, and Z. So the dictionary is the x, y, z, and the z, z, z. Yeah. Is that uh, x corresponds to, so is that, uh, I'll, I'll just write, uh, I'll write corresponds to, if x is not equal to, x corresponds to c, y corresponds to d, and z corresponds to b2. z has degree two, and x and y has degree, cohomological degree zero. <laughs> Function. You use the C twice, right? And the location. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Maybe this is you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's use C. Yeah. Right. This C is not that C. Right. Right. Okay. So, well, let's do one last observation on this interesting example because uh, this is going. So, one observation is the following. Let's look at uh, what is actually. So, this is a generalization of Coulomb branch from 3D and equal to four supersymmetry to only half of the supersymmetry. <laughs> so the old Coulomb branch used to be a holomorphic symplectic variety. So one common, all 3D and equal to four bow varieties are holomorphic symplectic. Or hypercalar. Because we did uh, holomorphic uh, synthetic reductions all the time, starting from a holomorphic symplectic uh, MS space. But now we dropped some holomorphic, we dropped the mu inverse zero condition. Therefore, what we get now for 3D n equal to two bow varieties, only Kähler. So we did a Kähler reduction instead of a hyper Kähler reduction. What is this Kähler variety in particular? Well, and of we, the, our definition is just, uh, we know what's coherent sheaves on this variety, which is that matrix circulation category. But it might not, it might or might not be coherent sheaves on anything. But nevertheless, let's be brave and do some approximation. It's roughly speaking, the, the variety is the critical locus of W. So let's be brave and in this case, let's, it's easy to find the critical locus of W. W is B2CD. So, so critical locus of B2CD is just you set uh, like two of them to, 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 to be zero, like just the three coordinate axes. Crit B2CD is just uh, go it this way. Union of three coordinate axes, B2, C, and D. So this is the C axis, the D axis, or the B2 axis. And now, uh, so roughly speaking, it's like this. So first of all, this is complex one-dimensional. So if you look at the Coulomb branch here, well, the old Coulomb branch is P star of C. It used to be complex two-dimension. Now this is only complex one-dimension. So, so therefore, um, well, this complex one-dimensional thing is actually the expected dimension of, of the geometric Coulomb branch here in this case. Uh, I'll expand on that in a moment, along with the, that dimension count in particular uh, that I erased probably. But uh, first of all, it's one dimensional. And second of all, if you learn from the causal matrix factorization, which I also erased, this one I can reduce to indeed coherent sheets or something. But this situation is very rare. In general, it's not possible. In this case, we can. So if we can, then why not let's do it? So the C-graded matrix circulation categories after Kazoo 
it's just coherent sheaves. Um, well, B is like the Lagrange multiplier. CD is the constraint. So only have one equation, so no need to derive anything. Just plain zero locus here. CD is equal to zero. Uh, and of course, B2 is also zero. What is this? You see that this is just these two axes without the B2. So, so this corresponds to just this part of the geometry. And uh, you might think that B2 is lost, but actually, no, it's not lost because you see it still in the calculations of homomorphisms between objects. So this B2 is here because this B2 has cohomological degree two, and wh whereas C and D has cohomological degree zero. They are the classical part. And the B2 part is actually the singular support part of the singular variety CD is equal to zero. You see it by harming, so if you harm uh, structure sheet on A1, on A1 supported on the C axis to A1 on support on the D axis, you will see exactly the polynomial ring generated by B2, which is a DG algebra degree two. So you see the B2 through harming some, something supported not on the to totality of the singular variety, but something that passes through the singularity uh, and that's not a free module. Okay. Yes, now I can. So, so now, now that we have this, uh, this abelian mirror symmetry, so the conjecture, of, well, the abelian thing is not a conjecture, you can just show. The abelian mirror symmetry is the following, that for Kaya category of this particular synthetic manifold, let's say I have, uh, now let's specify the grading. So the degree here I call so the degree of wrapping here, uh, degree, I call it degree zero. This is the degree zero part. And the degree here, two. And the degrees here and here are, I mean, as long as they add up to the correct number, I do not really want to specify. So maybe degree here is zero. Degree here is you need to compute so something. So just compute. So th this particular Fukai category of the, this of this uh, variety is isomorphic to the ma Z graded matrix factorization category on the uh, on this deformed uh, so let's say here I have n one punctures and n two punctures and the corresponding quiver would be in fact uh, would be fermionic node one and then bosonic node, uh, sorry, and then the framing node N1 and N2. So I would consider this bow variety where I just draw this bow diagram out. I cut it somewhere in the middle here. So I, I deform here. On the right-hand side is C1 all the way until Cm, and then uh, C, C, Cn1, and then uh, Cn1 plus 1 all the way to Cn1 plus N2. So I, I divide in the middle following this N1 and N2 division. I still keep all the moment map constraints here and there, but uh, the intermediate moment map constraint is dropped. So the global functions here is actually u plus u minus is equal to, it's called this, b1 to the n1th power times b2 to the n2, n2th power. b1 to the power n1 times b2 to the power n2. So I, I, re I resolve this, of course. Yeah, so the bow variety in, in this case, the ambient space will be the resolution of this singularity. 
and the potential is actually equal to CDDC, so CN1, BN1, BN1 plus 1, CN1 plus 1, which more convenient way to write since CD is equal to DC all the way here, I can trace it back to B1, and this guy I can trace it back to B2, so it's D1, B2. And here I give grading. So B1s are wrapping here and B2s are wrapping here. Remember that B2 is the wrapping on the puncture. So B1 has degree zero and B2 has degree two. So as a result, uh, the total degree of U plus and U minus will be two times N2. And uh, so I'll, I'll write the wrapping here. So the, the first few wrappings are controlled by B1, and the next are controlled by B2 on the boundary. This is controlled by U plus and U minus. But the mirror symmetry literally maps the coordinates here to like the wrappings here. So now, um, about the uh, so 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 now is the conjectural statement uh, about the non-abelian case. Uh, the, on the A side, we get Foucault category of symmetric products of this puncture sphere. But, sorry, yeah, this is originally due to AEKO. I should have mentioned that. It's originally due to. Yeah, I was like a rule, uh, Ephimov, uh, cut, 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 Ephimov, 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 Kasarkov, and uh, Orlov, Orlov, yes, about 2010, I think, or 2011. This is a reformulation out there. They use the toric model, whereas we use this model, but essentially it's the same, same mirror symmetry. They considered all the possible gradings. It's also possible for us too, but we'd prefer this particular grading. The conjecture is the symmetrization of this. It's the kind of category of the symmetric product of k fold symmetric product of this thing. It's equivalent to the z graded matrix factorization of. Uh, so now the relevant quiver is K and one and two. And uh, the corresponding bow variety will be K. So I change my C's to CK's so and nothing else changes. Everything else is the same apart from the C, C, C to the K. So I would allow moment up conditions uh, at all of the nodes apart from the middle one, the potential, this time is trace of CDDC, trace of this thing. And and then try to match them. Uh, that's I ideally the way is to be able to find generations on both sides and try to match them. Uh, uh, um, so that's one hard point. The other hard point is uh, classifying objects or knowing what to map them to in the matrix factorization that you because for the I think for the is it clear here um, to which matrix factorization like to map things or oh, I'm going to introduce a dictionary in a moment, but yeah. not on this conjecture, but in the modified one. I, I will modify it because in this conjecture, I do not yet know how to write down tilting bundles on this ambient space directly. Okay. And, uh, if you look at 
uh, series. We are only looking at uh, hundred shares instead of also like hundred covers. Um, for uh, here, I'm looking only looking at punctured spheres uh, because I'm dealing with um, this particular quiver. Well, so there's a follow. You know that there's follow up paper to this a zero five nine thesis. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. It's so, natural to ask how whether that. Uh, I, I I do not have an answer. You know, I, <laughs> Yeah. That's a natural, but, yeah. Yeah, but he brings it naturally into matrix representation context. And uh, that maybe connects to uh, what you said earlier, Paul, that um, one, one might ask oneself is, uh, but that's a big sort of discussion, maybe after you can start, that the construction of um, Shohan and Dao could be applied to this case. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, so now the, uh, I forgot to say the Z grading. The Z grading is of course here. This has total Z grading zero and the other side has total Z grading two. Same zero two splitting. But the, this time C to D two is not equal to B one because C to D two, C to D two is equal to, it's not equal to, well, D two C two is equal to C one D one and this doesn't, uh, C one D one doesn't commute with each other necessarily. So it's written this way. And then if you want to subdivide this, these gradings, you can. Um, well, you just say that C2 has degree zero, D2 has degree zero. You pick either C1, C3 or D3 to have degree zeros or two. Or maybe you can even evenly split the grading. It's, there are several conventions for this. But the, the grading here is the same, it's zero and two. So that's the conjecture. And uh, what what we what we actually write down is the following. So what we actually write down is the modified. In the abelian case, it works, but uh, I'm going to write down the modified thing anyway. So what we actually try to show in the project is we consider for kind of categories of a partial compatification of the puncture sphere by some stacky points. So this is a schematic picture. Inside of here, I put point mod mu two. So what do I mean by this picture? This is a schematic picture. What it actually is, is uh, the Foucault category of this, is the mu two equivariant Foucault category on the ramified double cover of the cylinder ramified at these points. I'll draw the following picture. Let's say we have four punctures only for simplicity. And I do two branch cuts, therefore, here I have two uh, little circles. And then I have a genus here. And the rest looks like this. So this is a double branch cover of that geometry. And there is a, so it's this guy, it's this space. But mu two equivariant for chi category, here. and the mu two is the one that uh, flips uh, the two sheets of the Riemann surface. So the so effectively, this is just uh, a cylinder with some points that are stacky. So this mu two actually has four particular fixed points, which are here. And mu two equivariant for chi category just means that we consider mu two equivariant Lagrangians. So therefore, we can write down objects here that actually generate the category, and the objects are th the following kind of objects. So it's more convenient if I slightly shift this picture to draw my object. So downstairs in this picture, on this picture, my object, if I shift the positions of these ramified points to, to this vertical location. I like to pick these as the primary generators. So I have Lagrangian running this way and then a bunch of Lagrangians that does this. This is the minimal number of Lagrangians that I need to choose to generate the category. Uh, why is that? That's because, uh, well, the middle homology, well, there's a theorem due to Riemann 
for Poincaré, like 200 years old maybe, that the middle homology is generated by some cuts. So how do we find middle, how do we find the, to find the basis uh, of middle homology? Well, this doesn't literally show the generation, but uh, it will show non-generation if you drop some of these or do not choose it like this. So to find a basis of, a Z basis of middle homology, H1 of a surface, of a Riemann surface, You just have to do some cuts uh, on the Riemann surface such that after the cut, it expands into a contractible polygon. To find the basis, you just have to do cuts. So cuts, so the cuts on the Riemann surface, sigma. Uh, cuts CI on sigma such that uh, sigma removing the cuts is, is the same as a polygon. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm not, okay, so that's my next sentence. So here, this is Riemann's generation result for sim one. Uh, Riemann also, um, there's also a resulting algebra topology saying that H1 of uh, sigma, sorry, H middle dimension, HK, that's middle dimension, HK of sigma, of sim K of sigma, is isomorphic to uh, taking the sim of, of these H1s. It's not sim H1. Um, it, it's, it's generated by in those middle dimensional classes given by product classes of these H1 generators. I forgot the notation for that. Oh, this is that back one. Okay. That's my McDonald. Okay, okay. So McDonald. Does that McDonald has an A in his name? Two A. Two. Oh, okay. Sure. But uh, yeah, uh, right. homology, and then you spec specify to middle. Well, this is true. Then you can specify to middle degree. And in fact, uh, Oru's result categorifies this statement on middle homology. Um, so Oru says that uh, the Oru's generation result in 2010 tells us that uh, these Lagrangians, uh, when you take sin k of them as product Lagrangians in sin k sigma, uh, actually strongly generates Fukaya category of sin k sigma. The product of of these Lagrangians drawn shown here in the picture. Uh, generate uh, the Fukaya category of uh, sin k of sigma. And uh, it's intuitive to draw these pictures here so that uh, people who have read Oru's paper can immediately see that these are precisely Oru's generators uh, generalized to this case. Oru considered maybe punctured hyperlipid curve with maybe two or three punctures. Here we have four. So this one lives to a Lagrangian like this. Here, it passes through the ramified point once. And then we have this one which is this Lagrangian. And then, of course, we also have this one, that one, the last one. These are Lagrangians like this. The last one is a double, it's truly a double cover. Doesn't go through the ramified points. And here, if you, re if you re remove all of these cuts from this, this Riemann surface, you get actually two, two polygons exchanged by the mu2. So after quotient by mu2 is one polygon. So again, Riemann's rule of generation of middle homology here. So this is the A side, uh, abelian A side. Or, or abelian or non-abelian, you can take symmetric product of this, of the actual thing that we want to show. And the B side is also a modified version, B side. 
for that is uh, the P model. I mean, uh, they draw the, the quiver is uh, K and one and then two. And one and two just reflects the gradings. Zero, zero, uh, sorry. There's no distinction between N1 and N2 now for, for, for that model. In that model, all of the punctures are filled in and no longer have wrapping at those punctures anymore. They're not punctures, they're singularities. They, they are ramified new to stacky points. So um, the B side would be the following. It will be a degeneration. It will be a more, a more boring version of this matrix factorization in that I still set C2D2 to equal to C3D3. I go back to the old 3D and equal to the Coulomb branch, and I restrict the potential there. That's what happens on the B side. So. Yeah. Um, right, so with a, a plus M trace phi squared, yeah. yeah. When we integrate the phi out, we, we, we yeah. when we integrate the phi out, we literally get this, actually. Right. But before, but, but before I do it, yeah, before I do it, I had a phi square term, but I also had another term with phi, with linear phi. So yeah, but here I'm literally doing the phi square term. Just no. doing, um, but but yes, I'm doing it. Yeah, 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 yes. I restrict the whole thing onto this, where the linear term goes away. That's the best way to say. Right. Uh, so I'm just going to write down the mathematical statement. <laughs> That's the, uh, yeah, so the C graded matrix, matrix factorization on the 3D n equal to 4 Coulomb branch, the old one. Usual bow right, which is a subspace of that. And here the potential is equal to trace. So now that uh, now here C C C D is equal to D C all the way through. So W will be trace of C two D two squared. In, in other words, uh, since trace CD is also trace DC, you can trace back, you can trace it back to, um, well, sorry, here it's better still to write trace, uh, well, I can write trace B1 squared or trace B2 squared here, doesn't really matter, all equal to each other, or trace of any intermediate CD squared. That's the potential. And I still want my matrix factorization to be Z graded. Therefore, this has to have total degree two. Therefore, each B has degree one. This is a different grading imposed because uh, these B, B1 and B2 used to be wrapping at the punctures, but now the punctures filled in and somehow changes. So the grading is B1, B2 has degree one. Therefore, C times D has degree one because B1 is equal to CD. And DC. So it's totally a convention. You can pick your symmetric convention if you want. You can pick them to be one half. I'm going to pick them to be zero and one. And C1, CI is zero and DI has degree one. Here, the splitting is pretty, it's just a convention. It doesn't, doesn't really matter too much. The, the grading on the A side changes accordingly. That's true. The, this, in other words, known as the horizontal case horizontal Huber scheme of the AN minus one surface. And that's maybe, I don't know whether that's helpful or not. <laughs> um, okay. So if I present it this way, then the W has a different, uh, I have a different way to write down my W. That's maybe, a, that maybe can make it slightly more. Uh, so it's, it's a horizontal Huber scheme with respect to the projection map 
which is the in from from the a n minus one surface, which is uh, the resolution of u plus u minus is equal to z y uh, y y to the y to the n or z to the n. I project it to the y plane. It's this horizontal Hilbert scheme. Horizontal with respect to this map. It means that I can, the maximal uh, domain of, of the of this uh, densely defined map from horizontal, from Hilbert scheme K of the alien surface to Hilbert scheme K of ZY. And in terms of this coordinate system, I can write my W as uh, summation of YI squared. Y, y1 squared plus y2 squared plus yk squared. Because the y's are precisely the eigenvalues of my B matrices to trace through the slow variety definition. And this is a symmetric polynomial of y. It, it's a global function here. And so now uh, we'll, we'll, I'll end with a matching of objects. So this, uh, let's, let's see. So the matching of objects is I'll draw, uh, so I'll just ask where does those uh, generative Lagrangians go? Some other Lagrangians. So the easiest Lagrangians to match are the following. Uh, uh, there are certain kinds of Lagrangians called t braids like Lagrangians like this. Uh, so, so now I have, let's be specific, I have three punctures here. Therefore, uh, like this is the abelian case, quiver one, three. And what does this correspond to? Well, I will, this is a Lagrangian on the A side, which after passing through the double cover thing is two lines there. Um, and on the B side, I have uh, the following matrix factorization. So let's write down the B side first. B side is parameterized by this. And so the way I read this is that uh, this line passes through the first two punctures. And each puncture actually, so each puncture represents a pair of arrows. So this line corresponding to this node. So it's, it's, it's this node. And at this node, we twist by, uh, by one. So I'll consider a certain line bundle here called O10. There's O10, there's OMN in general for these two C stars. I consider O10, and I form the following matrix factorization. From 0, 1, 0 to 0, 1, 0, back and forth, we just do B1 times B1. Just, uh, this is B1, B2. B1 is equal to B2. It's B1 times B1. So, so technically, since I have my Z grading, uh, uh, B1 has degree one, I have to specify that these two O10s one zeros have different uh, C star covariant degrees. So this one is actually shifted by one in terms of the C star equivariant grading. Since I'm in the equivariant category. So this is this particular T brain. Similarly, if I, I can draw the two other ones, this one will just be O01. This one corresponds to that node. And the factorization is still the same. Potential is B1 squared. Same, fact, same easy factorization. And the last one will be O00, naturally. Like the three tilting generators from the very beginning of the 3 dn equal to four story now becomes this. So this would correspond to O00, just O, O shifted by one, B1, B1. This is a preliminary match of the three so-called T brains, T Lagrangians. And then there are the so-called stable envelope Lagrangians, which goes from the puncture, goes from the singularity 
to one at the end. And we can also match those as well. So. So this particular Lagrangian starts from the first puncture. Uh, the first puncture corresponds to the first pair d1, d1. So um, it turns out that the corresponding uh, matrix representation for this is the following. That uh, is starting from O, I'll first write c1. So this sends O to O of 1, 0. d1 has equivariant degree 1. C1 has C, uh, equivalent degree one, zero. And C1, with respect to the grading C star, has degree zero. That, that's my convention. You can pick one half, one half if you want. So this guy doesn't have a shift like that. The inverse map is just D1 times B1. So since C1, D1 is equal to B1, the product is also B1 squared. As a level of hackers, what's the relationship? The top one, and the top one, the top one, and this one. Oh, there's so. This is another picture just for. Uh, so there, I drew that kind of U-shaped Lagrangians because the. Oh, I'll talk about the Hobbes in a moment. Uh, first, let me first write down the object match. Now here, it's pretty clear that if it's the ith puncture, just C i d i, it's the same b one, so etc. Now I've giving you the dictionary of all of the objects. Let's try to match the Hobbes. And matching the Hobbes is a calculation in the category of graded matrix calculations. And so for instance, the homomorphisms up there, uh, if we have such a picture, this is three punctures, but uh, four punctures is slightly easier to draw. Let's draw it four punctures. So, so let's say we can, if we consider this Lagrangian, this Lagrangian is a particular stable envelope as Lagrangian here. That downstairs, it is this one. Uh, the endomorphism of this to itself involves wrapping here and wrapping here. So the endomorphism of this. Yes, I'll take mu to invariant in there so that you get a polynomial ring. This is isomorphic to I say the, the wrapping on the two ends, maybe alpha and beta, C of alpha and beta, alpha beta is equal to zero, um, alpha composing beta is equal to zero, then you take S2 mu2 invariance of this. So this will be isomorphic to C alpha plus beta, since alpha times beta is zero. Polynomial ring. Why the polynomial ring? Because there's only downstairs, it's clear, it's only wrapping here. This is a joint wrapping there and there, mutual equivariant. And in fact, you can compute this, you can identify this generator with some, you can compute the endomorphism of this matrix acquisition here. It doesn't matter which one. So you can also, you can also deal with another one. As you compute this exact same computation, you'll get this polynomial ring. So the endomorphism algebra of all of these stable envelope Lagrangians, the polynomial ring. Which polynomial ring? Well, here, you can try to compute the endomorphism here. And the calculation would feed you um, with a two by two matrix, with two by two matrices and uh, differentials, which I won't, uh... <laughs> I'll just write down the answer. The answer is pretty nice. The answer is the following. Hmm. Well, so the, the 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 answer is I also I'll represent this particular Lagrangian using a, a, a diagram so here. I will have so that let's say there are four functions. Just so that the picture is nice. The three punctures we will, picture will be slightly, uh, so there will, there will be three instead of four uh, open ends. So these are the four punctures. The, these, these positions are fixed. And then, um, so a, an endomorphism, well, 
But an endomorphism from this guy back to itself is represented as that diagrammatically, let's say this is the first one, it only wraps in this direction. So it, it's only allowed to go in the positive way back to itself. You can see it's a polynomial ring because it only goes positively. So this is nothing but a Bukaya category interpretation. But this, you can write down the matrix. The corresponding matrix is something uh, which actually a two by two matrix, which looks like uh, D1, D2, D3, D4. 0, 0, D1, D2, D3, D4. So the D corresponds to wrapping positively around this end. The D matrix, the, 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 the Ds. Oh, it's two by two because uh, here I have two line bundles. So compute the one of them from this to itself, all expressed in terms of a two by two matrix, and it's this one. And similarly, if I put D1 here and C1 here, you can imagine just C and D flopped. If I put D1 here and C1 here, the direction also flips. So the wrapping on this side is the D matrices, and the wrapping on this side is the C D matrices. That's the, that's the dictionary. Right. It's all polynomial ring, only wraps in one direction. If we say that the corresponding um, the object which corresponds to this R um, is a matrix representation made up of just one line bundle on the left, one line bundle on the right, or some. Oh, uh, in, in, this, in this abelian case, uh, if I want to match these kind of specific kind of objects, uh, yes. Uh, Everything becomes just line bundle, line bundle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. O only for these ones. But, ask, why is there a reason why we write the matrix as the angle matrix? Oh, there is no reason. It's a computation that I that I didn't do. It's a it's a it's an involved calculation. You have to compute the endomorphism and identify it as a uh, and identify the cohomology as a polynomial ring generated by one object. This is the generator. Turns out to be the case. You need to compute. Wait, this matrix is the differential that goes into the, the light. This matrix is not the differential. This matrix is a morphism itself. This is a morphism from this thing to itself. Ah, uh, that actually has de true. degree four. Yeah. It, it has degree four, right? Because DI has degree one. This is degree four. Why degree four? Because the total wrapping here has degree four, actually, yeah, right. if I give it that grade. So I forgot the, to write the grading here. It's degree four, degree four, degree zero, degree zero. If you sum up, it matches the order characteristic. Two, two times minus all the characteristic. Yeah, the, uh, G0 corresponds to wrapping on the uh, C1 corresponds to wrapping on the left. C, uh, that's my convention uh, yeah. for, for this wrapping. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So CI wraps here, DI wraps here. That's, uh, this is uh, more or less the abelian case. Apart from the only subtleties that you have to match, this gigantic DG model with the small DG model on the A side via some A infinity quasi isomorphisms. Uh, now that was the press. That won't... That's true. There's only this cohomological gradient left. Uh, there's uh, right. This this cohomological gradient is the old Q gradient. And, and now. Um, for the non-abelian case, you just basically take the symmetric product of the abelian case. <laughs> how? I uh, haven't told you about uh, how to deal with coherent sheaves on, on, on the non-abelian case, but it turns out that there is a, a thing called KRW algebra, which is basically symmetrizations of these kind of uh, basic things with one strands. So, um, So I think I'll, I will not have time to fully explain the whole thing, but I will end with one particular example, which is the differential in Hagar floor theory. The, part, the partial crossing is equal to identity relation. Because... For the bigger model, yes, right? Which is just a path hagar the whole space, and just mirroring his entry by right? 
you can you, you you can first do the mirror symmetry without the trace by squared that's the old 3d n equal to four one and then try to deform one side deform the b side by trace of by trace of uh this b b squared and ask what the A side is, but I do not totally understand how that works yet. Uh, is, is it better to hold a 10 minute break and continue in more detail after that? How, or, do you think you will... how about this? Let's say the official <laughs> seminar ends here. I will switch into a discussion. I just summarized the non abelian case. So, the non abelian case, I, I'll summarize very schematically. So, so I think I'll conclude in, in 10 minutes because it will be a very schematic proof of the partial crossing with equal identity relation. Very schematic. But I'll write down the matrix. Okay. Or, okay, if you want to explain, I think then that's what you're asking for. Let's say, okay, how about five minutes? Okay. Five minutes. okay. Take a five minute break, start our life, get some food, and everything. Okay, so let's resume this talk with a very quick summary of the Webster's work in his paper about tilting bundles and KRW algebras. Very, so there's this following fact that I uh, by Ben Webster. Based on works of Basil Kandinkoff and, and Kaladin. That, um, so I'll just state it in our primary example today. Coulomb branch for quiver KN. So the resolved additive coulomb branch in this case. In other words, the k-fold horizontal Hilbert scheme has a set of tilting generators. So it just has so coherent sheets of this. Has tilting generators. Has a tilting generator, which is a direct sum of a bunch of vector bundles. P such that NT is an algebra that de that's describable combinatorially using strengths. So NT is isomorphic to the so-called uh, Hovenov uh, Lauda Rukia Webster algebra. And what is this algebra? It looks a lot like uh, these representing diagrams that we drew here about the wrapping. And they do reflect the wrappings on the on the A side. But uh, I'm going to do a B side calculation with them. So the algebra in, in this case has k moving strands and n fixed strands. So the, in the obedient case, there was one moving strand, which is like the Lagrangian itself, and there were n fixed strands, which are the fixed positions of the punctures. Now we're sort of taking a symmetric product, k-fold symmetric product. We're allowing k, k, k Lagrangians to move in this symmetric product. And there is, it is generated by, so the, the fixed strands are colored orange, and the moving strands are colored white. And so it is generated by, so on, on the white strands, we also allow dots. And it's generated by these relations. So first of all, most one of the most important relations, the, this new hacker relation that, uh, dot times crossing minus crossing times dot is equal to identity. And then there's other this other local relation. Whenever a run, running strand, moving strand crosses over a fixed strand, it gains a dot if it crosses back. Uh, 
And then, of course, there's also this relation um, that uh, once you do a crossing this way, then maybe it's minus will be minus that in cases this way. Like this minus that is equal to identity. And there's, of course, also the braid relation. Uh, so these are some, the, the, these are the relations. And these diagrams are organized on a cylinder. The cylinder represents the, the, the direction of the wrapping of the Lagrangians on the ends. So, they are organized on the cylinder where I have some fixed strands here and I have a bunch of moving strands. And the diagrams look like this. The fixed strands just keep fixed where I have some, some, some number of moving strands doing whatever they want. Um, like this. Or maybe with dots on the moving strand as well. So it turns out that uh, the, the number of, uh, of this tilting generator decomposes into indecomposable vector bundles and the number of indecomposable vector bundles coincides with the number of idempotents in the gigantic strand algebra. So that's the statement of the Webster's theorem. And for us, we'll be interested in um, matching certain Lagrangians with matrix factorizations. And we will form those matrix characterizations using the direct summons of these tilting generators. How do we do it? Uh, first of all, let's match the easy Lagrangians as usual. The easy ones are the ones that goes from zero to infinity all the way through. So let's, for simplicity, let's do the case of two something. Maybe two, two, two three, for instance. or two, four, doesn't really matter. Um, so we have two moving strands, four fixed strands. And um, we have, there, therefore we have the following Lagrangian. We have four uh, singularities here. Each of these are mu two stacky points as introduced before. And we have one Lagrangian going this way. Maybe the other one, also fits in the same slot or goes to some other slot. Let's see, maybe like this. I just draw something here. This is a Lagrangian. This is a Lagrangian inside seam two of this uh, hypergeometric thing quotient by mu two. This is the, an equivalent Lagrangian inside of here. And the corresponding object for this, so this is, this is in the this is in the Pukaya category. On the coherent sheet side, remember the ambient space is uh, so this is MF, whereas the ambient space is the coulomb branch, it's the resolved coulomb branch of the two four quiver. The two four quiver uh, has the KRW algebra with two moving strands and four fixed strands, and the potential is uh, actually uh, phi one squared. So it is trace b squared, and potential is y1 squared plus y2 squared. And it turns out that y1 is the dot on the first moving strand, and the y2 is, is the dot on the second moving strand. So it turns out that y1, we have this coordinate matching, y1 is equal to this, and y2 is equal to that, with, of course, fixed strands in arbitrary positions. There is matching of y1 and y2 with the dots. In well, y1 and y2 are endomorphisms within any um, single vector bundle in this gigantic tilting generator. I'll just uh, abuse notations and say that they are called y1 and y2 throughout. So 
the potential is y1 squared plus y2 squared. We know what to do when it's only y1 squared, when y1 was b1 and we did just b1 times b1. So now we do exactly the same thing. So now with this um, Lagrangian, so the matrix factorization is going to look like a tensor product matrix factorization of two abelian ones. I'll write it like this. So let's see the we have uh, four punctures here. And then the two dots are here and here. These represent the move, the strands that can potentially move. So this picture with a circle labeled by positions of the, the dots and crosses is, is, is a particular um, vector bundle inside of the big tilting generator. Big tilting generator is a, it's a direct sum of all the possible diagrams like this with two dots and four crosses. So these, these four are just the same object all the way, th all the way through. And I take the direct sum here, direct sum here, and then I do, I consider a matrix factorization that goes both ways. What is the matrix factorization? It is, uh, well, in fact, to write down the matrix factorization, I'll have to shift this guy by one, by degree one. And then the matrices are the following, y1 minus y2 minus y2 minus y1, that's the first matrix. Second matrix is same, y1 minus y2 minus y2 minus y1. So, so what does minus y1 mean here? It always means that, uh, so y1 here is in particular, since I've fixed positions of these strands, y1 here would just be adding the dots to the first strand. Uh, here, keeping the second strand fixed. And then the positions of the rest of the moving uh, fixed strands are as follows. This is y1. And y2 is just dropping the dot here. So this is a particular matrix factorization. You can check. This is just the tensor product, imitating the tensor product matrix factorization of two uh, one dimensional like, objects. There. It is imitating because these tilting bundles are not uh, exterior tensor products of, line, of those line bundles. Yeah. So, what's the analysis uh, derived category of the Bloom branch? And you can pull this through to the matrix factorization. So, the matrix factorization is something that is totally. That, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah that, that's what we considered. Right. And so, uh, so you're you're going to construct a functor of two matrix factorization, and you're trying to match this up, but it's not just clear. That, that's correct, right? I'm going to so so now I'm matching the objects. I'm going to uh, construct a functor from one category into yeah. the other. Um, classification of objects in matrix factorization category is often quite hard. Uh, so it's, it's often case, quite hard. In in this case, I currently do not have the generation result on my matrix factorization side yet. I, I have a, okay, I, I have a strategy, but the strategy didn't work out uh, yet. So the strategy is to think about uh, categorical stable envelopes, as you will see in a moment. Uh, you will see, as I write down the full dictionary, you will see them. So this is the easy part of a dictionary, just do nothing. Uh, just, uh, well, just take the easy take the these Lagrangians in the dictionary like this and kind of uh, tensor two of them together, sort of like pretend to do that. It actually makes sense when you write down the matrix separation. So now you do the same thing for the rest of the thing. So suppose I have a Lagrangian which is a T brain which goes from zero to infinity on one strand and the other strand goes from this puncture to infinity, then I just take two of these and just play that game again. So I'll just, all the other kinds of uh, matrix factorizations, I only need to do this one example and you understand how it works. 
So let's, for instance, do, do an example, which is like this. The same four punctures. Let's say I have this Lagrangian together with this Lagrangian. If I have such a pair, then you just uh, notice that, well, for this Lagrangian, I factor my b squared into c times uh, into c times cb. If you just do that factorization with this KRW diagrams, you actually get another matrix factorization as follows. So this matrix factor. So so the dictionary is the following. The dictionary is is uh, B, the B matrices are the dots. And the C matrix is this crossing, left crossing. D matrix is right cross, is, is right crossing, uh, crossing from left to right of the fixed strand, uh, uh, of, the, of the moving strand, across the fixed strand. So in particular, B is equal to CD. As you can see, this is the, the primary relation, local relation in KLW algebra. B is equal to CD. Sorry. So following this dictionary, you can write down the matrix factorization now. This, this one, uh, to write this one down, you need uh, two line bundles there, which I, yeah, you need two. You, you need two line bundles, O and O one zero. So uh, the line bundle O is like this line bundle, and the line bundle O one zero is this one, and this is like in the middle of the two. So here I do the same thing. Here I write down first of all two vector bundles on the left and two vec two vector bundles on the right. That's the same. Uh, since I'm doing more or less tensor product matrix factorizations, metaphorically. I have two terms on the left, two terms on the right. So what are the terms? Well, I first label the fixed strands. And then I label these uh, moving strands. So first of all, I always have this one here. This one is always here. I just draw it at all places. If this one were a, a T brain going from zero to infinity, I would just finish it, finish this game easily. But if it's like this, I just uh, kind of go from here to there. I just jump. So for this one, I turns out that the answer is like this. The two of the vector bundles are the same. Like the two dots here are separated by one cross, and the other two are the same. And then write down the KRW diagrams following this rule, remembering that one factorization is uh, B times B, the other one is C times DB. And each diagram is local, but two. So I, uh, okay. This is, this is maybe hard to see from the back. This is all KRW diagrams. I I will I will represent using okay. I'll represent them using notations. So I'll write uh, there will be B one and B two for the two strands. There are two kinds of dots. So the dots are Y one and Y two. Uh, dots are Y one and Y two. We already use Y one and Y two. And the corresponding C is there is a C one and and also there is a C two. The C2 represents the other, the second strand crossing one of the one of the lines. And the C the one C1 and C2 is not labeled by I running from one, two, three, four. And same as D. C1 I D2 I. This is the I fixed strand. Yeah, so so this yeah, B is equal to C D can mean many things here. And, and now I can write down so 
this would be Y1 box tensor identity. This is a metaphorical notation saying that I just add one dot to my first strand and I, didn't, I add on top of identity map one dot on my first strand. And then this one will be identity tensor the crossing in this direction, which is D1, ah, sorry. Like how this D is called let's see some reason. I used the opposite conventions, D and C. This one is, uh, Y2 times uh, crossing in this direction, that's D. And crossing the first uh, puncture, uh, crossing the first fixed strand, that's D1 of strand number two. So if I'm going from here to, um, so sorry, this entry describes going from here to there. See, this dot wants to cross to the left. And when you cross to the left, it's so D is this is D diagram on the second strand, but uh, following that rule, whenever I have the D diagram, it can be it will be accompanied by this D one. D one is the dot, which is the second dot y two here, and similarly you can write down all the rules. This one tensor. Uh, so the board is going on in the C one of two. That term would be the only term there, right? Which term? Oh, that term. <laughs> Um, maybe this term will be the only term. Like that's the common entry. Yes, yes, yes. And and same here. This is y one tensor one. Uh, with, with some sign, with some plus minus sign. And then here we also get y one tensor one. So you can see when you multiply these two, you get y one squared. And when you multiply these two, you get y two squared. Uh, here I just copied, it's the same matrix. So, it's the same matrix, up to a sign, so if I put the sign here. If you modify these two matrices together, you just get uh, y1 squared plus y2 squared on the diagonal. So this is the rule for writing down the matrix circulation. Here I used uh, wrong notations to suppress the difficulty of drawing the KLW diagrams. So why do you think this is better than the shape uh, First of all, T-brain basis will not generate the category, most definitely in this case. And, and these uh, kind of mirrors the generator, well, uh, this is more than what generates, but it's more symmetric. The, the minimal generator we've chosen is not symmetric enough. One T-brain here, a bunch there. Why not add in all the T-brains at the same time? It will make the algebra easier, actually. Because in the KRW algebra, if you compute endomorphism of just one tilting bundle in there, it's hard. But when you consider all of them together, like gradually change and consider the whole KRW algebra, it's generated by these rudimentary relations, simple relations. Here, I, I like these generators. I like all of them because oh, if I write all of them together, it's easier for me to write down generators and relations. So generators are what? So my generators are, uh, yeah, so a, lots of generators. Uh, so my generators are, for instance, I can, I mean, I can, so if I have, So first of all, in the abelian case, the abelian case, my generators are the following. Like I can have a stable envelope mapping to a T-brain. Like this map can generate, or from T to here. And actually, when I compose these two, I map I wrap from here to here. So this is not a generator. So you see, uh, the some some of these things are like. They are they are subdivided into finest pieces. Here. Yes. Yeah, I can I can merge the computation of humps between pure stable envelopes and pure T brains 
if I merge them together, I get a bigger algebra with less, uh, I don't know whether less or more, but uh, with controllable <laughs> generation relations. But uh, with the A infinity structure might be. The A infinity structure on the A side is easy. A side is small. On the B side, uh, on the B side, the, the DG, okay, there's never higher multiplication. That's, that's the thing about, that's what's good about Oru's generator. Okay, I forgot to write it down, but it's a theorem of Oru that uh, even when you, even after you take symmetric product, when you compute endomorphisms of same case of these Lagrangians, same case of these, these kind of Lagrangians, either stable envelopes or T brains, there's, you get the DG algebra. There's the A infinity algebra without higher multiplications, just differentials. And the differentials and relations are, so the, 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 the differential, the, the only differential is partial crossings identity. The differential is part B of lo, a local crossing is identity. And also um, you will have crossing squared is zero. But uh, here you want to compare this guy, not with the part to a rule of but the one with the, with the mu two in the name. Mu two is the multiplication. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, mu two, oh, mu two. Oh, that mu two, I think. Uh, but uh, the oh yeah, so Oru computed the bigger guy. All I need to do is to symmetrize. And to symmetrize in this case, is a, is, this is an easy symmetrization. So after symmetrizing, I still get basically polynomials that, you know, just basically still follows the wrapping here and there. And you're right, I should symmetrize these things as well. So you see each crossing here, each crossing here is actually up there, two, two symmetric crossings. So everything here you need to symmetrize. You, you need to take a look back on the mu2 uh, cover and then take mu2 equivariance. So that's a rough dictionary. That, that's the dictionary of how to write down these objects. I take this object of symmetric products of uh, K of those Lagrangians. It's the same rule. In general, that matrix is going, it's going to be two to the K minus one minus two to the K, K minus one. It's going to. Computing is by hand for every K. That's true. Uh, I'm I'm still in the process of working of sorting out this 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 DJ quasi isomorphism because the first one I wrote down has flaws in it. Um, but uh, so okay. No 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 not the same. No because uh, on the B model calculation I got a huge DG model the endomorphism. Uh, What's the underlying vector space of the DG algebra? It's all possible harms between these things. Gigantic matrix algebra. Then you have a differential which kills almost all of them, except the ones that are left that you see on the A side. I, I do not expect so, them to match on, on, on the nose. It's not. Both of them are DGAs. So on the A side, you get a DGA. B side, you get a DGA. They have different sizes of the underlying vector space. Uh, first thing to show, of course, is that they have the same cohomology. That's a weaker statement than saying that they're quasi-isomorphic. But if you can show that they're just quasi-isomorphic as A infinity algebras, that's a corollary. The reason, uh, I mean, there, 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 there's, there, 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 there's no a priori reason why any, uh, why any two like quasi isomorphic A infinity algebras have to agree on the nodes. So it's just a general phenomenon.
But do you think you'll be able to have a general proof? Or I guess you have to. Uh, to prove this mirror symmetry, I'd better have to. So that's the part, you see, that's the in progress part. Uh, we're working towards there, but I, I need to work harder on that part. That part is harder than I thought it was. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's thank you, John. Okay. Thanks.